trying to design an ER diagram to represent some certain problem. Um, they ask something like, how do I require an entity to copy a key from another entity? And the answer is, one of them is a weak entity, one of them is a strong entity. So, an example. Consider the difference between a course and a class in like a university setting. A course has a subject, a number, a name, a description, so something like CS5530, that's the subject and number. Um, the name is database systems, the description, in this class we study, etc. Um, okay, so this is a course can be identified. It's a strong entity. The course can be identified by essentially the combination of these first two things. There's only one department called CS, and within that department, there's only one course with the number 55 thing. So those two things combined does identify an entity. So the course <coughs> is a strong entity. And all the other entity sets we've seen are strong entities. I just didn't specifically call them strong. Okay. And then a class. So what's the difference between a course and a class? A class is a specific offering of a course. So like this class right here, the spring 2020 offering of database systems. Um, there was also the spring 19 offering of this class. There was the spring 2010 offering of this class. So there, the difference between a course and a class is the course is you know, kind of just the thing that goes into the catalog. We've been teaching some databases course for decades. Um, every instance of, the, of that course, those are classes. So how do we identify a class? Well, it's a semester and a reference to the course. So this thing here is the course. Class is spring 2020, CS55. So let's try to draw an ER diagram that represents this. Okay. So we would have, let's see. Now we have a little small, I'm getting more. So we would have courses, entity set. Uh, we would have <coughs> classes, and then there's a relationship between them. Right, so a class must belong to a course, so we make that line double. A class must belong to one course, but a course can have many classes. And so there are many offerings of CS5530 throughout the years. This particular class only belongs to one course. How do those sections fit into So how do sections fit into it? Yeah, that would be, you would kind of make it, you would name that sections of class instead of classes. But we'll leave that out for now, just for simplicity. So there's, say, there's only one section of this class. Uh, so this relationship would be called, you know, I don't know, offering or something. Okay. Um, a course has an attribute, has many attributes. One of them would be maybe like the, the course ID, and it's the key. A class has at least a semester. It could have other things, other attributes like enrollment count or something like that, but the rest won't really matter. Okay, so so this looks right. You know, this looks like it starts to represent the problem. Um, a course must belong to sorry, a class must belong to one course. A course can have multiple classes. Um, now the question is though, what is the key for classes? How do we uniquely identify a class? Um, semester and the course. 
combination of those two? Yeah, so semester and course. Combination of those two. So the problem is, semester is part of the key. The rest of the key comes from a different entity. So let's, let's just draw some little examples here. Let's try, let's say, you know, so I have spring 20 um, CS5530. Those two things identify this class. <coughs> I could have spring 19 CS5530. Those two things identify a different class. Um, I could not have, again, I could not have another like Spring 20 CS5530. That is not enough. Um, but there's not enough information in the class's entity set to make that key. The key is the combination of both of those things. Right? You can't just make semester the key. That would mean that there can only be one class per semester of, in the entire university. So basically what we need in the diagram is we need some way of showing that classes has kind of another field here. But I can't just say that it's CID. Because that's just another attribute called CID. I have to specifically say that that comes from somewhere else. And this is not the way we draw it. We don't just draw an arrow and another attribute there. Um, and what makes this problem unique is that this is a weak entity set. It cannot be identified by its own attributes alone. It's identified by one of its attributes and a key from another entity set. So the way, we, and ER diagrams do have a way of representing this. The way we do it is, it looks like this. It's kind of subtle. <laughs> the difference is, it's a double rectangle for a weak entity set. And a double diamond for the relationship set that it's that it borrows part of its key. From. So double rectangle means weak entity set. And any weak entity set has to be at at some point somewhere in the diagram has to be supported by a strong entity set. So the relationship is special. It's called a supporting relationship, and so it gets a double diamond. Um, furthermore, the relationship has to be one to many. And the weak entity set has to participate. So you have to have the double lines there on the weak side. Um, the strong entity set does not need to participate. It can, <coughs> but it doesn't need to. Yep. I don't see why it needs to be one to many. Can you do one to one? Can you do one to one? Um, sort of, yes. The thing is, though, once, once you start <coughs> translating this into tables, which we haven't seen yet, once you start translating into tables, um, it would make sense if it was one to one to just put the attributes into the other entity set. If a, if a course could only have one class, then you can just put that into the course instead of requiring, uh, instead of allowing multiple. And it's hard to really answer. I mean, you can do it kind of either way. It's hard to really answer that until we see translation to tables. Um, can this work for ternary relationship as well? So you can have you can have a weak entity set supported by multiple strong entity sets. Um, a weak a, a ternary relationship can be a supporting relationship as well. Yes. Uh, the other thing, so so you can have I could have another supporting relationship, so like another double diamond, going to some strong entity set. You can have that. You can also have, well, let me just make a new slide, I'm running out of here. Um, You can 
also have the weak entity set um, supported by a weak entity set as long as somewhere at the end of the chain there is a strong entity. A terrible guy. <laughs> so weak, weak, strong. Would it be possible for the strong entity set to be forced to have a minimum of one of the following weak entities? Yes, you could make this <coughs> double line. You could make it so that the strong entity set has to have at least one weak whatever. Okay, so back to this slide. This is just the same slide I already showed. The weak entity can't be identified by its own attributes. Um, it's identified by a combination of its own and some other attributes from another entity set. So how do we say what that combination is? Um, we use a dashed underline to represent a partial key. The weak entity set does not have a does not have its own attribute that is a key. It has a partial key. It can be one attribute. It can be a combination of attributes, just like a key. And so I'm showing here. Not all attributes have to be part of it. So I have like the location is not part of the partial key. It's just semester. Um, so then how do we know what the rest of the key is? Uh, specifically because one of its one of its relationships will be a supporting relationship with a double diamond. So that's how we know what the key is. You take the partial key, you combine it with the key from the entity set on the other side of the supporting relationship. So the key for classes is CID, comma, semester. But we don't really this is and this is how we show it. We do not put CID over here. This is just the syntax in an ER diagram for how you show that. Yep. So just a quick question. So if courses uh, had a composite key, uh, would, uh, would those just both be normal uh, underlines? Yep. So if courses had a composite key, you know, something like X over here, they just they both get underlined. Okay. And then for the weak entity, they have to have one of their own attributes uh, part of the key. It's not like you can just use. The key from uh, yeah. Or the, the yeah. Other so key. a weak entity set has to have a partial key because that one's main. Exactly. Yep. So in the case like this, where the primary key of courses is a compound key, uh, the key of classes would just be the combination of all three of those things: CID and X and semester. If let's say location was also part of the partial key, then it would just be all four of them is, is the key for classes. So you just combine them all together. Is it true that the weak entity can have other relationships but it will always have one double time relationship? So it, can it have other relationships? Yes. It will always have at least one supporting relationship. It can have more. So I think that's actually my next slide. Yeah. So a weak entity set can have non-supporting relationships, um, and this makes perfect sense in a university. So a class has to be supported by a course, but it can have a normal relationship with a professor where um, you know, you know, the professor is the teacher of a course. So in this diagram here, what is the key for classes, and how do we know? Yep. Would it be a CID semester and UID? So, is it CID semester and UID? That's kind of the question. Yeah. No, the way we know is this is not a double diamond, meaning it's not a supporting relationship, so we don't pull the key in. So it's kind of subtle. You just have to look at the shapes. The double diamond is what means that's where we pull the key. So the key is the same. The key is CID comma semester. The UID of the professor is not involved 
in the key for classes. And so this is saying a class must have one teacher, and a professor can teach zero or more classes. Okay. All right. So that's those are kind of the major components of the ER model, and then we'll see how to translate them into questions. Um, so my next question is, uh, can you have multiple like uh, relationships with strong components? Like, could you take a key from UID and CID? Could you take a key from UID and CID? Yes, you could make this a supporting relationship. <laughs> yep. Are there any specific advantages to having something new and then just push the strong entity? Are there advantages to having a weak entity? No, not advantages. It's just that they're that's the only way to express certain certain things in an ER diagram. So go back to all the way back to here. How do we make an ER diagram that's that represents classes and courses? So let's pretend we don't know about weak. Oh, I already saved those. I can't erase that. Let's pretend we don't know about weak entity sets. If this was our ER diagram, this is mostly correct. This represents, okay, a class must belong to a course. But then the question is, what's the key for class? How do I uniquely identify a class? Can't be semester. Um, you can't just make something up. So let's, let's just try to invent a key for it. Class ID. So then this table would look something like this. Class 1, class 2, class 3. This, so even though those numbers are unique, this still allows for duplicate semester and course combinations. So what we need is the combination of semester and something from another entity set to be the key. So that's that's why that's where we need a weak entity set. Isn't that though how like CIS works with courses? Doesn't each course have its own individual class number? Each course has some kind of unique identifier. Each class does not. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, I I just think CIS does have a, a unique class ID for each offering of each course. Okay, if it does. So even if even if you did invent something like this, um, that's still not what the ER diagram would look like. So CIS still has this requirement that every class is identified by it, some of its own attributes and some of the course's attributes. And then whether or not you make up some new column identifier, that comes down to schema refinement. But this is what this is what the ER diagram would look like. You'd have to have a weak entity set there. The supporting relationship. What if you wanted to offer multiple sections of the same class in the same semester? If you wanted to offer multiple sections of the same class in the same semester, um, different teachers. Yeah. So you would just add another attribute, kind of, say like section. Or something like that. And that would be part of the key yep. in combination with the CID and it's still unique. It still has to be unique because a class belongs to a course. Okay. Belongs is the wrong term. A class cannot be identified without a course. Okay. So that mostly wraps up the ER model. There will be a few more things, as I said, coming throughout the semester. We need more context first. So we'll take what we have now, and we will start addressing the question of how do we convert an ER diagram into schemes. Um, the, what we've been doing before we had the ER model, you know, I started just kind of on the first day, I started showing some tables like the library. Um, it's, it's a correct relational model, but it turns out without, without starting with an ER diagram, it's kind of hard to get the right, the, the, a good relational model. 
So we'll actually see the library is not quite um, the best way to represent it. And we'll see how it gets refined. But the good news is, if you start with the correct PR diagram, then you can arrive at good tables, good schemes. So, um, and, and there's an algorithm for it. You don't have to just, it's not guesswork. It's, you just follow the steps. <coughs> if you see certain shapes, they turn into certain tables. So the basic algorithm is every entity set becomes a scheme. Okay, that's it, just simple. And then relationship sets, they might become schemas depending on the cardinality <coughs> of the relationship, or they might get merged into a into one of the other schemas for the entity set. So we'll look at entity sets first. It's simple. Um, every entity set becomes translates directly to a schema. All you do is you take the attributes of the entity set. Each one of those attributes becomes a call in the schema. And then you take the primary key as described in the ER diagram, and that is the primary key in the table. Hmm. So let's look at an example. I have employees and work in departments, and departments have employees working. I've intentionally left off cardinality and participation constraints. Um, we'll get to those later. So for the entity sets, employees and departments, all we do is just make tables out of them. So they get SSN, they get name and pay, employees do. Um, departments get a department ID, department name, and a budget, according to this diagram. What does NN stand for? Okay, what does NN stand for? NN is not null. You will see, well, it's, hopefully it's obvious what that means. It means those, att those attributes are not allowed to have null values. Um, you'll see where it makes sense to allow them to have no values in a minute. <coughs> but for now, any attribute that you pull out of an entity set into a table should be not null. Okay, and then primary key is denoted there. How we know, well, SSN is underlined and DID is underlined. Okay, easy. Now the question is, what about the relationship set? How do we translate that into tables? And that's where it depends on the cardinality. So we'll look at many to many first. So if the work scene relationship is many to many, then the relationship set becomes a schema or a table. So we pull in its attributes, so we get since. And then I have kind of these question marks here. So the purpose of this table is to identify relationships between employees and departments. So this table needs to include information linking an employee to a department. And we've already kind of seen examples of this, like the enrolled table in a, in a university. Enrolled relates students to classes. Um, but let's just go through it formally. So what are the extra columns that a relationship table needs? And in order to answer that, we'll look back at the this kind of abstract set um, notation. So I have employees, I have departments, and I have works in. So I actually have three sets here. The, the blue lines here, these are actually, these are also a set. But they don't represent entities, they represent a relationship between two entities. So the question is, what information do I need to represent the blue lines? Um, well, let's just kind of fill in some instance data as an example. So let's say I have a person with a social security number of one and a name and some other information, whatever. And let's say I have a department with a department ID of CS and a name, computer science, whatever else the department has. Um, so how do I represent that blue line? What is it that identifies that blue line? It's essentially, it's, the, it's 
this whole thing and this whole thing is what re represents that relationship. So we, do we need all of that in order to identify the beam line? No. All we need is something that identifies the person and something that identifies the partner, which is SSN identifies the person, department ID identifies the department. So that, that blue line that I have circled there, that blue line is effectively, it is 1 comma CS. Okay. So what we do, and, and, and what is special about this? 1, or SSN, is the primary key of employees. Department ID is the primary key of departments. So what we do is we pull in the primary key of both tables on both sides of the relationship and make them foreign keys. So they are foreign keys in the works in table and they reference the primary key in the left table and the right table of the relationship. Okay. Now, question, what is the primary key of the works in schema. Is it SSN? Is it SYNCE? Is it DID? Some combination? Elimination. So, kind of back to a very similar question. Um, each one of these lines has to be unique because it's a set. So, what is it that uniquely identifies one of those lines? Well, it's the endpoints. So, like, those two endpoints is what identifies that second blue line down. So the combination of the endpoints, and remember the endpoints can be identified by their primary keys. So SSN, comma, department ID must be a key, must be a key. <coughs> so it's easy. That is the primary key of the relationship set. So I've rearranged the columns a little bit. I've just put all the primary key columns on the left, but we get SSN and DID. So SSN by itself is a foreign key into employees. DID by itself is a foreign key into departments. The combination of the two is the primary key in the relationship. If we wanted to keep track of multiple employments at the same department, could we include since? Yes. Yes. So if um, if we wanted to keep track of multiple uh, like multiple durations, like you can work in a department for two different durations, you would probably have started with a different ER diagram. You probably would have had a ternary relationship in the first place. Um, and then yes, essentially the effect would be uh, since would be kind of part of the primary key. So, as another example, what we've already seen, um, we didn't see an ER diagram for this, but we saw, like on the first or second day of class, we were talking about like students enrolling in courses. I have a students table, a courses table, and enrolled. The only purpose of the enrolled table is to bridge between students and courses. So, these tables here, they would have come from a many-to-many -many ER diagram where students was an entity set and courses was an entity set and enroll was a relationship set. And you have many and many. Okay, what about one thing? So I've changed the diagram a little bit, and the, the way that changes the description is a department can only have one man instead of many. Okay, so the way we do that, it's, it's kind of easy to think about. If a department can only have one manager, then why not just put that information in the row for that department in the scheme? So a department, you know, it'll have department ID, name, stuff like that, and then it'll just have a column for who is the manager. 
Since there cannot be more than one, then one column is sufficient to represent that. So this is the case where manages the relationship set does not become its own table. What we do is we merge on the many side. So we merge departments with manages. And that just looks like that. We pull in SSN as a foreign key. That is how we say who is the manager. And we also have to pull in any attributes from the relationship set. There's only going to be one of each, so we can fit it in on the same row. Okay, excellent question. So this, what this is not addressing is, should manager be null and should, is manager allowed to be null and is budget allowed to be null? Uh, another way to phrase that question is, is a department allowed to not have a man? And that's where we need to start looking at the participation constraints. So what I'm not really showing here is, um, this line might be double, this line might be double. So what we do is, on the many side, if participation is required, so the, the left diagram here, um, this is saying a department must have a manager. So we state that the manager column and the budget column cannot be known. If it's, if participation is not required, then we leave non-null off. So this is essentially the only case where you would allow a call to be null. Is in a, um, if you're merging tables, if you're merging a relationship set into an entity set, and the participation is optional, then you allow it to be null. Now that raises the question though. Um, so remember, these are foreign keys. The thing I'm pulling, the thing I'm merging in becomes a foreign key. Um, so this column here, but uh, manager is referring to SSN. So it's a foreign key in the department's table. But remember, a foreign key means referential integrity. Foreign key has to reference a valid entity in the other table. So isn't it kind of conflicting ideas that it can be a foreign key and allowed to be null? Um, well, the, the answer is yes, it is conflicting ideas, but SQL will let you, uh, it, it treats null as a special case. It will let you put in null as a foreign key. It will not let you put in any other value that does not refer to an actual entity in the other table. Null is kind of a special case in order to accommodate this sort of relationship. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. What happens if you have a participation constraint on the employee side instead of the department side? <coughs> What happens if you have a participation constraint on the employee's side instead of the so a double line between employees and managers and managers? Like that? Yep. So and and then uh, it's still optional on the other side? Yeah. So an employee must manage um, potentially many departments. So it must manage at least one department? Yeah. That, unfortunately, is difficult to capture in, um, in schemas. You can capture that in software with something called a trigger, where um, if you ever, at any time you kind of modify one of the other tables, you verify that the constraints are matched. Can't really do it with schemas. <laughs> and then for many-to-many -many relationships? And we just put an entity in between and then just two one to many's on either side. So we'll get to we'll get to this question of like how do you how do you enforce that something participates? The easiest answer is if it's like this, then you can do it. Um, 
In fact, I think it is, it's, it's coming up. We'll get to it. The answer is you can't always, you can't always directly translate an ER diagram into tables that it that often enforce everything you need. So back to this, remember at the beginning of class I said uh, we've been kind of doing a naive relational model. And this is the library we came up with. Um, but let's look at the checked out uh, table. And let's think about how checked out works. Can a book be checked out by more than one person? No. No. So, would, um, is, is checked out in the original ER diagram, let's say we had an ER diagram, would checked out have been an entity set or a relationship set? It would have been a relationship set. Um, but I just said, a book can't be checked out by more than one person, meaning it's not a many-to-many -many relationship set. Meaning, we can actually re represent that by just putting in a column in the inventory table saying, who has the book checked out? And it's a card. And it's allowed to be null, which means participation was optional on that side of the relationship. So a book can be checked out. It doesn't have to be checked out. Since it's one to many, we can represent that by just adding a column there. And we're down to four tables now instead of five. <laughs> so that's good because um, in order to remember when, so let's look at the full library. In order to answer questions like, what are all the books that Joe has checked out? We have to kind of combine tables together in order to figure that out. We have to combine patrons with inventory and then inventory with titles. We do that through something called a join, which we'll talk about later. Um, but in general, fewer joins means better performance, and fewer tables usually means fewer joins. So this library we have ended up with should be better than our initial attempt. They are both correct. So translating a one-to-many relationship can be done by making a new table. This is the, the better way to do it. So you're saying the relationship between inventory and patrons is one-to-many? The relationship between inventory and patrons is one-to-many, yes. Can you put that in the English sentence? A patron can check out multiple books, but a book cannot be checked out by multiple patrons. <laughs> can we do the same thing with like phone numbers then, since the phone numbers can only have one person using it? Could we do the same thing with phones? Well, it depends on what meaning you want. If we want a phone number to be shareable by multiple people, uh, then no. Or if we want a person to be able to have multiple phone numbers, then no. Um, phones, though, phones is not a relationship. Phones is an entity. So. It's always going to become its own table anyway. Okay, one to one. Um, how do we represent this? Treat it as one to many for the purposes of merging, um, or for the purposes of translating the tables, which means we're going to do a merge. So if I, if I have like an employee can manage one department and an apartment can have one manager, then just pick a side. It doesn't matter. Just say, pick either left or right and merge the relationship into one of them. So this, the way I've done it here is I've decided to take the DID and make it a foreign key in the employee's table. So employee can, that's how I say this employee is managing that department. And since it's one-to-one, -one, I have, you have to make sure you specify this. This means um, a department can only be managed by one person. You cannot have the department ID showing up multiple times in that table. Now, if you have participation constraints on one side, that forces the direction that you merge. If a department um, has to have a manager, then who manages the department goes into the department's table. And you say that it's not null, since it's required. Okay. Does it matter if one table 
have, uh, or one table is expected to have many more rows than the other table? Does it matter if one table is expected to have many more rows than the other table? Yeah, is it better to put the larger oh. column in the shorter table? Right, for if, if participation is optional on both sides, yeah. then yes. That, so that comes down to the schema refinement step, where you have to, you'd have to kind of know which one you expect to have more and what kinds of queries are you expecting to do. That's where kind of later you can go and refine your schemas before converting them into tables. Yeah. Do you have a partition be mandatory on both sides? Okay. So participation mandatory on both sides. I'll get to that in one second. When it comes to this other question about uh, is it even possible to represent in tables? One more thing though first is uh, supporting relationships. If we have a weak entity set and a supporting relationship set, um, it's one to many, so it works the same way. You merge into the many side, and then the only thing that's special here is the primary key becomes the combination of the partial key and the foreign key that you merge in. So straightforward there, makes sense. Okay, what if we have required participation on both sides of some relationship, um, regardless of the cardinality? So I haven't even shown the cardinality. Um, so, you know, what would be on the left side here is like people on the right side would be departments. So let's just think about this. A person has to manage a department, and a department has to have a manager. So remember, though, what this means is is foreign keys. So a person would have a foreign, this manages table would have a foreign key into people and a foreign key into departments. So let's say the table is initially empty. We're adding the first data into this database. Um, so I'm going to add like the first um, manager into this manages table. We cannot add a row in, into a table where the foreign key value does not exist in the other table. So I'm going to add, let's say I'm going to, I'm going to add a manager with employee ID of one. Okay. What is the department that that employee manages? Here's the department's table. Um, there's, there's nothing in it. Because remember, this is, these are, we're starting with the empty data. This is Here's the employees table, there's nothing in it. I'm trying to create the first employee. An employee must manage a department, so how do I add a row into this table? There's no such department yet. Okay, so let's make the department first. We'll make a department, but a department must have a manager. But I, just, I, I was unable to create the manager because the department didn't exist. I can't create the department because the manager doesn't exist. So it's like a chicken and egg problem. Um, you, you just can't do it. So this is where you cannot translate this ER diagram into a schema that represents that the same thing. So what you do instead is just in software, you you have to go and create one of them first, and then later you just go and make sure you create the other one and then link them up. Can you create both simultaneously? Can you create both simultaneously? Um, you can do two commands but they, and put them into something called a transaction to make sure they both happen, but you cannot create them simultaneously. Not even something like the forward declaration, like you can do with a time class or what? Yeah, so you, you can't do anything like a forward declaration or anything like that. It's like um, one thing has to exist before the other, and the other has to exist before A has to exist before B, and B has to exist before A. Like it's a logical impossibility. So you just have to do it in temporary steps. Flip the direction of the foreign keys. Flip the direction of the keys. That would have a different meaning. Yeah. What about the possibility of merging the two if they're both compliant? Merging the two? Yes. Into one entity. So what, so what if it's many to many? Then you'd have a table with tons of duplicate information 
if you can have many possible relationships between entities in that re in that table. But you know, it's not a big deal. You you just do it in software. It's fine. Okay. Um, let's take a short break now, and then we'll sort of reference slide that describes essentially the whole algorithm. Which means I have to use kind of shorthand notation, um, but I'll explain it. And it'll be useful for reference later. Specifically, like uh, you might want to put it on, on your notes for an exam. So, this is the syntax I'll use where you have E1, entity set 1, E2, entity set 2, uh, a, a relationship set between them. Question marks on the cardinality, we'll fill that in with like what if it's 1, what if it's M, and then the attributes. So E1 has attributes 1 through attributes N. Um, the underlined 1 is the primary key. The relationship set has attributes R1 through RK, and E2 has E1 through the M. And one of them is underlined, that's the primary key. Okay. So that's kind of just a general syntax here. You will build up. So what do we do with these question marks? Um, if it's many to many, so M on both sides, then so how, how we read this is we end up with, we create a schema for entity set 1, a schema for entity set 2, and a schema for R. So we'll end up with three schemas. And the attributes inside of each are, are shown here. So the, the attributes of entity set 1 are just its own attributes. Same for entity set 2. For R, its attributes are A1 and B1, because those are the primary keys from E1 and E2. And of course, it gets just its own attributes. And then red means also foreign key. So the only kind of the special thing here is that A1 and B1 are red and they are both underlined. So both underlined means they're the primary key for R and A1's a foreign key, B1's a foreign key. Okay, if we have one on the left and M on the right, then um, we only make an entity set for E1 and E2, we don't make an we do, or sorry we don't make a schema for R. We merge, and the direction of the merge is based on which side the M is on. So E2 gets A1 as a foreign key. That's kind of the the only special thing there. Oh sorry, and it gets all of R's <coughs> attributes. So we only we only end up with two tables. Okay. If M is on the left, then we just merge the other way. So E1 gets the foreign key and the R attributes. If it's one to one, you just pick a direction to merge, or you might be forced to merge based on participation constraints. But this slide doesn't show participation constraints. Um, and you have to remember to mark the foreign key as unique because it's one-to-one. -one. There can only be one of them. Okay, so that is essentially, like this slide, as long as you understand what it means, will be useful. So don't just go and put this slide in your notes and say, okay, I'll be good on the exam. Like, <laughs> you go and refer to it and spend 10 minutes trying to remember like what all these symbols mean. Make sure you understand it. Also make sure you understand why. Like. Why do we merge one way if it's 1 to M? Why do we merge the other way if it's M to 1? And so remember, I've said we're only going to use the term one too many to represent these relationships. So both of these ones in the middle, I call them one too many. Um, they're just different directions of one too many. So this is really the place where it matters. Okay, and then finally, there's a little more to it. How do we decide not null? Um, that's determined by participation constraints. And total participation on both sides 
Um, as we saw, you know, that's like the chicken and egg problem. We can't really do it. So you just we'll do that in software, and we'll kind of see how later. Okay. So SQL. So we can go from a relational model, or sorry, we can go from an entity relation model to a relational model. Now we can go to actual tables in a database. Is it a common occurrence to have uh, the particip participation department on both sides? Is it common to have participation on both sides? Um, I would say no, it's not common, but it's not impossible. Um, in our, in the LMS that we'll make, your final project, there will not be any cases of that. Okay, so how do we convert a schema into a table in SQL? Um, here's the general create table command, but I've left in like placeholders. So it's kind of like a regular expression of sorts. Um, so create table, that's the key command, and that's like a keyword in SQL, and then you give it a name, and then in parentheses you specify <coughs> column name, column type, column properties, and then comma separate for each column. And then after all the columns you can specify table-wide properties. Um, but they're optional, so you can, at least the name and the type is required for each column, properties are optional. And it's a little weird. Note that um, the column name, type, and properties are just space separated. The columns themselves are comma separated. It takes a little while to get used to SQL syntax, uh, but you will. So what do we put in these type fields? What are the possible types? And I'll go through them quickly because you can easily um, use your programming knowledge and kind of find the right terms to Google. So lots of numeric types, just like in programming languages. There are various sizes of int. So tiny int, small int, medium int. Um, and then the way you specify an unsigned int is kind of backwards from the programming language. You would say int unsigned instead of unsigned int. Um, real numbers, various forms of that, float, double, decimal. Okay, dates. So most programming languages don't have a date primitive type. You might have some, some date library. Um, most databases do have a date primitive because uh, almost everything that happens in a database, you want to know when it happened. Like when did they place the order? Uh, when did they submit their assignment? Things like that. So they're just very common, so they support them. So a date is just a date. A date time is a date and a time, you know, obviously. Okay, strings. Two different kinds of strings, but neither of them are called string. There's char m, that is exactly m bytes, m characters. Var char m is up to m characters. Blob stands for binary large object. So that's like if you wanted to create, kind of create your own type. It's not really creating a type, but it's just allowing you to put bits into the database. Like if none of the primitive types represent your thing, you just put some bytes in. Okay. So strings. Why the, why are the two different kinds? I mean, programming languages don't have two different kinds of strings. Not usually, anyway. Um, so exactly n characters or up to n characters. Well, the difference is so databases are all about like data integrity. Um, you want you want to be as restrictive as possible about what data can go into the database. So if I want exactly 10 characters, then don't use a bar char, use a char. That way it has to be exactly 10 characters. A string in a normal programming language, you can't say, like, I want a string, but it's a string of exactly only 10 characters. Okay. So, a couple quizzes for you. What's the best type or card name in a check gap? Some kind of integer? Unsigned. Yes. It should be int unsigned. Um, maybe you could argue for a medium int instead of a full int, but 
you know, in theory, you could have a, a billion library customers. Maybe this is a global library. Maybe this is Amazon.com. Uh, okay. Press type for author. Do the title state. Archer. Obviously, authors can have names of different lengths. So, how many? Archer, how many bytes? Well, um, it, there's not really a correct answer. It's just make it big enough to hold any author's name, but don't go overboard. There, there is some penalty to making it too big. Best type for ISBN? Char. So this is where, yeah, that's actually char. But let's say, what if we removed the dashes? It was just digits. Still char. Still char? Yeah. Why? Because it would still take less memory and string than it would in bytes. So would it take less memory and string than it would than it would as an int, like a long int? So how many, so this, it's uh, 13 digits as a string. It's 13 characters, 13 bytes as a string. You could make a long int, it would be 8 bytes. It would actually be smaller. But, any other reasons? Uh, you want to use char because it's an invariable number. Yeah, you want to use char because, like, 15 is not a valid ISBN. So this is where we want to specifically restrict the, the possible values that can go into that column. An int type would allow any number in there, even 0 or 1 or 2. An ISBN always has a certain number of digits. So, char 14. Yeah, just one question. So, I, if I remember correctly, some versions of SQL used to let you kind of keep some bound checks that if a so field... So, yes. You can put bounds checks on and say, do not allow any ints to be added that are like less than a certain value. Um, but you have to do that with what's called a trigger. And then it's applied like whenever you run an insert command into the table. It's better to just say the type type restricts what can go into it. Okay, so char is for when you want to restrict, you know it's exactly a certain number of characters, like a phone number or a, an ISP. Um, bar char for things like authors, names, stuff like that. So for the, the ISBN, um, you would be natively restricting knowing, but you would also be allowing there to be like letters like S and there's stuff in there. It can still be invalid ISBN, but... Yep, that is true. You are allowing other letters in here. So you would have to have triggers either way if you really wanted to like disallow letters going in there. Yes. But it's better to do less with triggers and more with types. Is there a way to represent a Boolean value? Bool, yep, there are bools. There are, I'm not showing all the types. There are lots of other types. What kind of characters are we talking about? Is it ASCII or Unicode? What kind of characters? You can specify the character in the coding when you create the table. So it could be ASCII, it could be UTF-8, it could be Latin 1, lots of options. Okay, so how do we pick the size for our chart? Well, you don't want to go overboard because, like, is it reasonable for an author or a title to have, like, a thousand characters? Probably not. Um, so just from a, from a design standpoint, you want to restrict it. But also, it does actually matter in terms of how many bytes are stored. So the way a bar chart works is it first stores the length as one byte at the beginning, and then it stores the bytes themselves. But if the length is greater than 255, then you can't store the length with one byte. It's stored with two bytes. Um, so, so you can go up to... Um, the size that two bytes is capable of representing, you cannot go bigger than that with bar char. If you wanted something bigger than that, there's another type called text. You can do medium text, big text. Those go up to like megabytes or even gigabytes. Um, so it does matter a tiny bit around this 255 boundary for bar char. So if you know you can represent something in less than or equal to 255 bytes, then use 255. Um, so that's types. And then what about those properties that I said? So when creating a table, you say column name, column type, and then optional properties. So those are things like not null. If 
like we just saw in translating ER diagrams. For almost every column, you want to specify not null. There are a few special cases where you do want to allow that. Um, you can specify a default. You can specify auto increment. That's where, for things like identifiers, like serial numbers, a serial number doesn't really mean anything other than it is unique. So I don't care what a serial number is as long as it's the only one of that value. So you can let SQL automatically just give you an incremented number every time you insert a row. That's what auto increment does. And then table properties, things like how do you specify what's the primary key, um, additional candidate keys. So that's just you know another uniqueness constraint. Foreign key and index. Index is how do you tell it you want a search tree built on that column or columns? Okay. So not null, as I said, just put it on every column unless your ER diagram said that it's allowed to be null. It's not just for design, it also allows the DBMS to optimize queries more effectively. Okay. Appropriate properties for card in the Patriots table. Primary key and auto increment. Primary key, auto increment, and anything else. Not null. Oh, isn't it implied if it's a primary key? It's not isn't it implied if it's a primary key? Yes. But it's always better to be specific, explicit. Okay, appropriate properties for card num, but in this table, in the check out table. Primary key? No. no. Foreign key, yes. Not no. Okay, so I actually didn't say foreign key here, but it would be a foreign key pointing to the other table. So the foreign key is more of, I'm calling that a table property rather than a, a column property. Uh, in the previous one, if you have auto command, can you remove one of the rows so if you have auto increment and you remove one of them, it will not reuse the old value. It will just keep incrementing. Okay, so let's create this table. Uh, without the context, we're just going to create the table itself. We'll see later how to insert rows. So here is an SQL command line. I'm, I'm on the database server, and I'm in a database called library down. Um, I can do show tables. So this database currently has no tables. It's just it's, an, it's a blank slate. So if I want to create the titles table, create table is just a keyword in, S, in SQL. And then I'm going to wrap it onto a new line because my font is so big, it looks like that. So query is not completed until you press semicolon. So you can you can put uh, multiple lines in here. So create table, and then in parentheses, columns, comma, separate. So the name goes first, and then the type. We decide it should be char 14 characters. Um, yeah. You need a name for the table. I do need a name for the table. Let me just kill that command. Okay, create table titles. Okay. ISBN is char 14, and then it is not null. Is it auto increment? Uh, well, no. First of all, you can't auto increment a string. Second of all, an ISBN does have a specific meaning. You can't just let it be any old identifier. It has to have a specific value. Okay. Title. Char, we'll do 255. It shouldn't be R company. Oh, yeah, sorry. R And not more. Author. Large R255, not null. 
we have to specify the primary key. Primary key. So the primary key is a table <coughs> property. I'm specifying it as a table property, not a column property. So the primary key is ISBN. And then this is kind of from one of the homework problems from homework one. We probably also want to say that an author cannot publish a book with the same title twice. So I would say, additionally, there is a key, a unique key, on title, comma, author. Okay. All right. There's our two. Question? So when you say unique open title author quotes, what that means is like every combination of title and author has to be unique? Yep. So that means the combination of title and author has to be unique. Okay, so if you wanted another unique key, you would have to, on a separate line, type unique out again. Yep. Another key. So I could have more keys here, it would just be another unique command. Do we have a style guide on how to name and capitalize? Is there a style guide on how to name and capitalize? Um, it's kind of like in programming. There are multiple different schools of thought. Um, pick one and be consistent. OK, that's the titles table. Now let's create the inventory table. Again, without the contents, just the table itself. So an invent the inventory table is um, what books does some specific library have? <coughs> Not just like what are all the books that have been published. <coughs> so create table, well, let me clear the screen. Create table inventory as a serial. What's the type for serial? Int, unsigned, um, certainly not null. Anything else? Because I don't care what the serial value is, I just need it to be unique. And then it has ISBN, which has to have char 14 as its type because it's going to be a foreign key. Okay. So there are the two columns. What's the primary key? Serial. And then we can say foreign key ISBN references Titles ISBN. Would it be possible to label um, inventories ISBN a different title and so have a reference title? Yes. ISBN? So the foreign key can have a different title, but it cannot have a different type. How would you uh, do an auto increment that starts at a value that's not one or zero? How do you do an auto increment that starts at some specific value? Um, there's, there's a separate command you can run after creating the table where you just say set auto increment to whatever value you want. Okay. So I have my two tables now. Let's look at the full library. Um, why, is, why is ISBN a foreign key in inventory and not a foreign key in titles? That's just, you know, it, it comes down to the meaning of which one is a reference, which direction is the reference going. ISBN is a key in titles. It is what identifies a book. It's a foreign key in inventory because it is what allows us to combine a serial number to a book. Okay, now I'm going to. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this insert into command in more detail later, but just quickly I'm going to insert into titles. I'll just make up some book. Uh, make up an ISBN. Okay. 
and some title, some author. Okay. Now I'm going to insert into inventory. I want to insert only ISBN because serial number will be automatically incremented. And let's say I try to give it some ISBN that is not in the titles table. So I put a 3 on the end instead of a 1. Foreign key constraint fails. Constraint <coughs> rep, um, ISBN references titles ISBN. Doesn't let you do it. So this is where, this is what I mean by referential integrity. It will not allow you to have a pointer to nowhere. So if I change that 3 to a 1, now it's happening. Right. One final thing. So here's the foreign key, foreign key command for creating the foreign key. What I didn't show is um, this stuff. Remember when I was talking about foreign keys? Um, so what happens if so I have I have an inventory item pointing to a title item? What happens if that title item gets deleted? And the then the referential integrity is broken. Inventory item is no longer pointing. And I said there's three options for what you can do. You can prevent it, you can set null, or you can remove both of them. And the way we specify that is we say on delete, and then one of either restrict cascade or set null. Turns out the fourth option is set default. You can set it to whatever the column's uh, default value is. So if I were to drop the inventory table, this is just to delete it because I'm going to recreate it. Oh, first it doesn't let me. I can't drop this table. Um, oh, sorry. It does let me. I was thinking the other way around. It wouldn't have let me drop the titles table because of the foreign key constraint. Anyway, let's recreate the table inventory. And so where I say foreign key ISBN references titles ISBN, I can say on delete. Uh, let's do cascade. So that means if I were to delete a title from the titles table, it would delete any corresponding entries in the inventory. That also happens when you like drop an entire table. Does that happen when you would also when you drop an entire table, uh, yes. Okay, we're out of time for today.